start recording. All right, so we are recording right now. Okay, first thing first, um, because we have not met from last Thursday, so let's count. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and this is Tuesday. So uh, it means that if we, we being myself and also you, if we don't review the material, we probably will forget some of the stuff that we learned in the previous class. So what do you guys do to make sure that we don't have to reintroduce the material? What is a, what is a good resource to use? My imagination. Your imagination, okay. That can be useful, yes? My YouTube channel, very good. Okay, so let me show you how to get to the YouTube channel. I might have talked about it already, but I think it really doesn't hurt to revisit that. So let me open a new tab. We go to, oh, well, I suppose, go to YouTube. And then you can always you know, just attach my channel name, which is some profs right after the URL of YouTube itself. Then you go to videos. And then you just look for the date of our previous lecture, and that would be the 24th, which is this one here. And then you click on it. And you know, I can mute it here because all I need to do is to see what type of material we just went through. So this is it's still base conversion. Okay, so if you go back here, this is base conversion. We are starting with a base two number and we're converting it into base 10. We're trying to figure out the value of that base two number. So just doing this, okay, a few minutes can help you reestablish you know, where we are in the class and hopefully it will bring your memory back at least a little bit of what we talked about in the previous class. Um, unfortunately for the lab, it's a little bit different because you know, what you learn in Logisim, you know, how you use your know, Logisim is actually important, okay? You know, a lot of the skill set that you have learned so far, like how we use a splitter, I know that can be annoying, is actually going to be useful again in the near future, not today, but in the near future. So you might want to keep notes of that too, okay? You know, if you are too busy doing the lab, you're doing the lab time, you can always do it after the fact, okay? Can someone tell me how many hours you're supposed to spend outside of class time for each hour that you spend in a lecture? Two, very good, okay, that is the correct answer. So if you're taking this class, okay, which meets 54 hours in lecture over the entire semester, you are supposed to be spending 108 hours outside of class time to study, to do your homework, to review your notes, to refine your notes, and so on, okay? That's a significant amount of time, and this is all about time budgeting, because if you do not budget that time, you know, then even if you have the best intention and you're really hardworking, when you don't have enough time, you do not have enough time, okay? And your grade is going to be affected accordingly. So you really want to budget enough time, and then, then you structure the time, okay? You know, to make sure that you are actually using the time you have already budgeted you know, to spend on this class. So those are really important. Um, it is going to be even more important after you transfer to a four-year university because you know they are they don't teach you that stuff. Okay, they don't even mention it. They just go like, "Yep, I assume that you already know that stuff." All right, so we are basically going back to base conversion, and today's lab is on base conversion, which means you know you probably want to make sure that you understand all of this stuff here. So what we're doing today are a few things. Um, we are going to focus on this formula and then find out you know, how it works. And then we talk about binary numbers a little bit, and then we move on to binary addition. So that's kind of the, the plan for today. Do we have any questions about the material from last week, from last Thursday? Questions, okay. So if there are no questions, we'll take a look at this little equation here. So can someone tell me what you think you know, this equation is doing? What is it trying to figure out? I assume the entire class read the notes ahead of time, which means you know, this should be a very easy question to answer. 
Yep, go ahead. Okay, very good. So it is base conversion, okay? So it's base conversion from the value back to the digit in a particular base. And then we, we basically specify which digit and what base and what value, and then we'll figure out what that digit should look like, okay? Very good, okay, that's actually is entirely correct. So can someone remind me what is D of I? What is that representing? Is digit I, okay? And what does digit I do in a number? What is a number? Yeah, what is 146? 146, what does each digit do in the number? What does the one do? What, what is the one in 146, 146, telling us about the value being represented? We have one of what? 100. What about the four? It's telling us we have four of what? 10, and then the six is telling us we have six of ones. Yes, okay. So what is the other way to write one as a power of 10? One is 10 to the power of zero. Very good. What is 10 in terms of your 10 as, a, as, a, as an ex exponent of 10? 10 is 10 to the power of one. Very good. What about 100? 10 to the power of 2. So that means digit 2, which is the 1 in 146, tells us the quantity of 10 to the power of 2. The 4 tells us the quantity of 10 to the power of 1, and therefore it is called digit 1. The 6 is called digit 0 because... Okay, what is the pattern here? What is the 6? The six tells us the quantity of, okay, we got the one, but in terms of power of 10, it tells us the number of 10 to the power of zero, and therefore it is called digit zero. Very good, okay. So, so D of I is digit I, which tells us the quantity of whatever base we are using raised to the power of I. Okay, the positioning is I, and then the B is representing the value being represented, and then the B is representing the base, okay? So we can represent the same quantity in any base we want to, okay? You know, as long as B is greater than or equal to two, as an integer, it's gonna work. So are we doing okay so far with all of those things? Because that's what we talked about last Thursday. Okay, I'm actually reviewing right now. But I cannot do, spend too much time reviewing content because we have this much material to cover in the entire semester. If I overlap the reviewing you know, a lot, then I won't have enough time to finish this content. Which is important because you know, when you transition to a four-year university, they look at you know, your transfer you know, units, you go like, oh, so you are supposed to know all this stuff already. So it is important for us to cover the content, which also means I cannot spend a lot of time to overlap between lectures. So reviewing is important. Reading ahead is also important. Are we good so far? All right? All right. So now that we, have, we know what we are talking about here, what about this symbol here? What do you think that symbol is representing? It is called the floor operator, okay? So I'm going to describe here what the floor operator is actually doing. So give me a second here to, oh, okay. I'm setting up my uh, tablet here so I can use my tablet as a whiteboard because sometimes it's easier to explain things you know, when it's handwritten and kind of give you guys examples. So we'll go ahead and go back to 
CISP 310 Tuesday, Thursday. And I make my own new notepad here. Very good. Okay. So I'm just going to define the floor operator here. So this is the equals to. Um, okay, I made that mistake last time, so I have to be careful what I say this time. Okay, so it is the largest integer that is less than or equal to x. All right, so do we understand the definition of the floor symbol? Okay, first of all, do we understand what, what, what I mean by the largest integers? So the largest integer between 4, 6, and 8 is 8. Okay, so we know how to compare. What about less than or equal to as an operator, as a comparison operator? Are we good with that one? I certainly hope so, okay, because you know, that operator should be introduced in CISP 300 and then 360. So now we're just making use of a fairly commonly used you know, comparison operator. So now, now that we understand what the offer, what the the how it is defined, can someone tell me what is the floor of 2.5? In other words, what is the largest integer that is less than or equal to 2.5? 2. Very good. Okay, so we got this one. And what about the floor of 4? What is the largest integer that is less than or equal to 4? 4 itself is an integer. Okay, so the answer is just four in this case, and I'll give you one little tricky one, okay? What is the largest integer that is less than or equal to negative 1.1? One? It's negative two, very good. It's not negative one, it is negative two. Okay, very good. So now we can go back and talk about the equation that we saw earlier in the slide. So right here, so now we look at this particular equation here, and we say, okay, so what does it do, okay? Well, it only gives you a particular digit in a number in base B when the value is B. That is what this equation will give you. So the question is, okay, give, give me an example, okay? Show me how this works. Sure, okay, so we'll go ahead and, you know, <clears throat> make an assumption here, so I'm making an example, and let me move this to the right-hand side a little bit so we can actually still see the equation. So that makes it a little bit easier for both of, for all of us. So we'll say, okay, the value that I want to convert into whatever base is, uh, let's make it uh, 72, okay? And then the base is Let's use 7, okay, base 7, and then i, which is, you know, the positioning of the digit, let's make that mm, 2, okay? Well, that's too easy. Let's put a 0 here. That makes it a little bit more interesting. All right, so now the question is, how do we apply the equation? Well, just plugging in. That's all we're doing, okay? We just have to plug it in. So because we know i is 2, so that means you know, we are trying to figure out what is digit 2. And then inside the floor operation, we have v, which is 720. And then we divide it by the base, which is 7, raised to the power of i, which is 2. And then we have a mod operator on the outside of the floor. And then we want to mod it with the base, which in this case is 7. So it boils down to that. <clears throat> so, do you guys want to evaluate it? I want to evaluate it. Okay. So, we are first looking at what is 720 divided by 49. And that would be 1 times 49. Um, let's see. Yeah, it's 49 because your 7 squared is 49. So, we have 1 of 49 here. And... And we have a 3 and a 2, so we have 230, and there are 4 of those here, 
So 4 times 9 is 36. 4 times 4 is 16. Plus the 3, we get 196. And then there's a 4, and there's a 3 now. So we have, with a remainder of 34. All right. But the remainder is not even important, because all we really need is to know that, oh, it's 14 point something. That's all we need to know, because we are taking the floor of 14 point something, which means you know, the floor, after the floor operation, what do we get? 14, very good, okay. So now we know that this portion here just boils down to 14. So we have 14 mod seven. What is 14 mod seven? Zero, very good, because 14 is two times seven, so there's no remainder when you divide 14 by seven, okay? So that means you know, we now conclude D2 is a zero. All right. So I just told you how to apply the equation. I claim the digit two of a base seven number in order to represent what we know in base 10 as 720 is a zero. What are you going to do? <clears throat> okay, just pretend that I don't know anything about base conversion or anything about this class. You have learned enough, should have learned enough, of, you know, in this class to verify and validate the answer of zero at this point. So what we will do is now to convert 700 and into base 720 into base seven, but without using this formula. So we'll do it by hand using the other method. So what is the other method? I hope you guys still remember. We basically list the powers of you know, seven. Seven to the power of zero is one. Seven raised to the power of one is seven. Seven raised to the power of two is 49. And seven raised to the power of three is 49 times seven, and that's 340. Okay, three, I think. There we go. It's 343 because 49 is almost 50. 50 times 7 is 350. But 50 and 49 are off by 1, and that 1 is multiplied by 7. So I just take 350, subtract 7 from it, and that becomes the answer. So this is you know, basically a trick when you have multiplication where one of the terms is really, really close to something in the teens, okay? 10, 20, 30, and so on. So that's a trick to do your know, calculation really quickly with those things. Okay, so how is that gonna help us? Well, we just have to now say, you know, we have a bunch of digits in base seven. And the question is, this what is this digit corresponding to? This is digit, okay, first of all, what is this digit? Is it digit zero, one, two, three, four, five, six? Tell me what digit this is. Digit three, that is correct, because we count, this is digit zero, because it tells us how many ones, how many sevens, how many 49s, and this one tells us how many 343s, okay? So how many 343s can I fit in 720? Two, very good, okay, so I can see. <clears throat> okay, so very good, okay, so this thing is two. So now we are looking at 720, and we took care of two times 343 already, so that is 686. You do the subtraction, the remaining portion will be handled by digit zero, one, and digit two. Okay, so those remaining three digits will take care of the remaining portion. So we got a four here, we got a three here, and that's it. Is it? Is that it? Yeah, that looks about right. Okay, so the remaining portion is only 34. So if you look at 34, and we are done with this particular power of seven, the next power of seven is 49. So the question is, how many 49s can it fit in 34? Zero. zero, that's why digit two is a zero. So as far as validating what I got earlier, I'm done, okay? So, okay. So we have um, 
So digit three is a two. You know, because of this calculation, you know, we have two three hundred forty three to fit into seven seven hundred twenty. So now we move down to the next power of seven, which is a seven. We still have a quantity of thirty four to take care of. How many sevens can I fit into? Um, how many seven can I fit into thirty four? Four of those, very good. Okay, so digit one is a four because we have four of seven to the power of one. That's the job of digit one, which is tell me the quantity of whatever base that we are using raised to the power of one. Okay, so we have 34 minus four times seven, which is 28. We have six left. So how many ones do we fit in six? That's a trivial question, but they do have to ask it. Six of them, very good. And that's why digit zero is a six, because it tells us once you know, digit three, digit two, digit one take care of the higher powers of seven, we only have a quantity of six left. And it only need, we only need six times one, which is seven to the, power, to the power of zero, to take care of the quantity of six. Is that okay? So the entire number is two zero four six in base seven. So the conclusion is seven hundred twenty in base ten is two zero four six in base seven. Are we good so far? So I'm gonna do one more thing. Okay, you know, we are gonna switch the whole thing around and say, can we apply that formula? to figure out what is digit one and get the four back. Okay, I just want to be sure, okay? Double checking everything. All right, so what is that, what, what is that gonna look like? D of one is going to be the floor of 720 divided by seven raised to the power of one, and then we take this whole thing and mod it with seven. So what is 720 divided by seven? You should be able to do it by hand. So this divided, we have 100 and zero. Okay, so we have 100 and zero here, and there should be a two here, 102. Do you guys agree? The 700, okay, so we'll do it by hand. Divided by seven, we have one seven here, and then we have 20 left. So, uh, oh, I should do it like this. 0 times 7, we have 0, then we have 2, 0 here, we have a 2 here, 2 times uh, 7 is a 14, so we have a remainder of 6. Okay, is that making any sense? So, 700 divided by 7 is 102 point something. That goes into the floor operation. What is the floor of 102 point something? 102, very good. Okay, so this whole thing boils down to 102. And now the question is, what is 102 mod 7? So if you divide 102 by 7, what is the remainder? Okay, there are two ways to go about doing this. You can say, well, we know it is supposed to be a 4 because of here. So now you just have to say, is 98, which is 102 minus 4, is 98 a multiple of 7? Okay, so you do it by hand, right? 98 divided by 7, we got a 1, 2, and then we have 2, 8 left. So it's 14, right? Let me see. Let me double check. Yes, so 14 times 7 is 90, 98. So that means, you know, we have, the answer is 4 here. Are we doing okay so far with the arithmetics? No? Yes? Maybe? Well, so the final answer, we are just putting the mm -hmm. remainder. In. Mm -hmm. We are just putting the remainder. Well, this is a mod operation. So a mod operation is a division, but we only care about the remainder of the division. And 102, 102 divided by 7 has a remainder of 4. If you're not sure about that, you can always use a calculator 
or just use Google to verify. Um, how do we use Google to verify this? Okay, so we'll open the new tab. You just have to say, you know, what is 102 mod 7. I think that would do it. I don't even have to click enter. It tells us right away it is 4. All right. So I'm trying to give you the tools, you know, to so that you can verify, you know, what I claim because you know it is that part is really important. By doing so, okay, I'm not saying that I will lie to you intentionally or I do not know the the content of this class, but I am telling you that if you just go like, okay, let's pretend the tech has been lying to us for the past 26 minutes, okay? How do I use what I already know? to check the answers, to check his claims. Because by doing that, guess what you're doing? You're studying, okay? This is one form of studying. It's really just look at the claims without any proof and go like, okay, have I learned enough to prove this by myself? And doing that particular exercise is studying. It is one of the best way to study. It's not just reading the material because now you're reading you're reading the gaps, okay? And you're trying to fill in the gaps that are in the reading material. And by doing that, you are exercising. You're giving yourself homework assignments. You're giving yourself the opportunity to practice the things that you have already learned. Is that okay? Because when you go to work, okay, and your boss says, well, we're gonna be a program, you know, the, the programming language I have chosen for this project is XYZ, and you have never learned XYZ before. So are you going to wait for your boss to give you homework assignments so that you can learn and practice to learn this programming language? No, your boss is not gonna do that, okay? So you have to learn how to give yourself the practice and ver your verification so that you can learn something new on your own. If I can teach you guys to the point where you go like, we don't really need tech to teach us stuff anymore. I mean, I can learn all of this stuff by myself. Then I have done my job. In other words, my objective is to work myself out of a job. That is my job. <laughs> all right. So that's base conversion, you know, and it only gives you a single digit, but that's now, the rationale behind the math is all this stuff before the equation. Do you have to read it? The answer is no. Okay? Uh, for those of you who are more math inclined, and for those of you who are curious, and for those of, those of you who want to understand the reasoning of stuff, that you can read. Okay? But if you just want to get to the bottom line, it's like, give me the equation, <laughs> tell me what it does, and I just want to be able to apply that, well, you don't have to read all of the other paragraphs. You just have to focus on the equation. But you better make sure that you know what it does. What is the job of this equation? What is the left-hand side? What does it mean? Okay? So that is something that is still important, even if you are just concerned about the pragmatic application of the material. All right. So are we doing okay so far with this? Okay? And there's a little statement down here that says, even if i is less than zero, it still works. In other words, we can take care of the digits to the right-hand side of the decimal point. Because when you do base conversion, well, I mean, you still have your know, digits you know, to the right-hand side of the decimal point, especially if the original value is not a whole number. Okay, And this allows you to figure out all the digits on the right-hand side of the decimal point as well. So now that we have talked about base conversion in both ways, what do you mean by both ways? Well, one way is this one. This one gives you the value of a number in a particular base, okay? Because on the left-hand side, we have the unknown as V. Everything else should be known. All the digits should be known, and you should know what base we are converting from, okay? So this one gives you the value of represented by a number in a particular base. The other one does the opposite. Okay, let me scroll up, scroll down a little bit. This one is the opposite. You have to know what the value is. You have to know what base you're converting into. And you also want to know which digit you're concerned about. But this equation will give you that one single digit 
in base b in order to represent v as a value. So even if you were to ignore all the rationale, the reasoning, the derivation, and all that stuff, you still need to know when to use which equation. Okay. All right. So now that we have you know, these two equations, how do we deal with base 2? That's easy. Base 2 is simply when b equals to 2. Because b is the base, so if the b is 2, then you're dealing with base 2. You can convert to base 2. You can convert from base 2. The, those two equations you will work with any base, including base 2. All right. So are we still doing OK so far with all this material? OK. All right. So that's pretty much the end of this one. Um, and then we talked about you know, how values are represented in the computer. Well, that has something to do with base 2 because, you know, do you remember the, the NAND gate that we did on the first day of class? Okay. So in terms of the input and the output, what are those digits? They're all zeros and ones, right? So you can interpret zero as zero, the value. You can also interpret it as false. And then you can interpret one as true or just the value of one. Nonetheless, there are only two, right? There are only two states for the input pins for each bit of the input pin, and there are only two states for each bit of the output pins. Where do you think the BI comes from in binary? What does it mean? It means two. That's right. Okay. So binary simply means two, and since the input pins for each bit of the input pin, it can only be zero or one. That is why we are so interested in base 2, because inside the computer, everything is represented by zeros and ones. Are we doing OK so far with this? All right. OK, so I'm not going to talk much about the exercise here, which is basically asking you to use your spare time, if you have any, to write a program to convert from any base to any base. So you have an input, you say this input is specified in this base, but I want to convert it to this as the output, the other base as an output. So can you write a program like this based on what you have learned in CISP 360, as well as what we just learned in this class? So, you know, that's it. You can use it as a thought exercise, okay? You don't actually have to write the code, um, but you at least you kind of think about, hmm, if I were to write a program like this, how is it going to look like? Okay, how do we get you know, the input in and then how do we get the output out? So do we have any questions about base conversion? Because without any additional questions about base conversion, we are moving on to binary addition. All right, we do not have any questions, then we shall move on. So we shall move on, and if there are any questions about, you know, how do I know what we are going to talk about after a particular topic, we just have to follow these links. The next one down is um, binary addition, because you cannot see today's road taking thing yet. And, well, let's go ahead and do it, okay? So I'm just going to, this is a good time, you're taking a short break, so I will take row, at least I'll give you the passcode you know, to today's road taking activity and it is just sub sub and let me um, unhide it okay so get back and once I unhide it you can use lowercase sub sub to you know, basically show me that you're here so the passcode is just Lowercase sub sub. The reason why that word popped up in my mind has to do with base. Subwoofer and base. That is how my mind works. It branches out in random directions.
right? So as you guys are doing this, I am going to transition to binary number addition. And then we'll get started with a very long and actually not so simple module. This module is, is pretty involved. So is anyone having any trouble, you know, in the role taking activity? So we all good there? Okay, all right. So now we're moving on to binary number addition. But the first thing I'm gonna do is something that we already know, okay? Because it's always good to start with things that we are familiar with, even to a point where it is boring, okay? Because boring means you know that stuff really well, okay, which is good. So we'll start with, um, an example and we'll go ahead and say let's go ahead and do some addition in base 10 uh, we have 637 plus uh, let's make it 366 there we go okay that's good this is all in base 10 okay so the question is do you know how to do this do you know how to carry on addition in base 10 and it's multi-digit? Okay, so I don't see anyone saying I need a review of this. So we're gonna proceed, okay? So the way I'm doing this is a little bit different in terms of the format you know, compared to what you usually do. So I am going to say seven plus six is three with a carry of one. And there's a implicit carry of zero over here. 3 plus 6 is a 9, 6 plus 3 is also a 9, and then 9 plus 1 is a 0 with a carry of 1, 9 plus 1 is also a 0 with a carry of 1 over here, and then please, 3 plus 0 is just a 3. And that's my answer. You go like, where's the 1,000? I mean, they should add up to 1,003, not 3 with the overall carry of 1. Nope, this is the answer. So from here on, when we carry out addition or subtraction, the width, okay, the number of digits between the first two numbers, in this case, four, 637, 366, will be the same as the sum itself. In this case, 003 is the sum. The reason why we have this kind of weird restriction is because inside the computer, when you're dealing with 32-bit numbers, you have 32-bit numbers. The sum does not get an extra digit just because, oh, we might bump over by one digit. It does not, okay? It, it has the same number of bits as every other number. So now we are basically saying, okay, so we are fixing the width, okay, to three in this case. So even the sum only has a width of three. Is that okay? But we do have that dangling, you know, carry of one. Okay, it is still here, okay, this dangling you know, one is still around, which is okay, okay, you know, we can just leave it around. Because that carry of one, what is it saying? It is saying with only three digits, we don't have enough digits to represent the actual value of the sum, and that's why we have a carry of one, because that carry of one means exactly that, okay? We don't have enough digits, so, you know, there's a carry. Are we good so far? Okay. So in order to generalize what we have just done, okay? Okay, first of all, let me just kind of back up a little bit. Do we have any questions about the calculation that we just did? The three digit plus three digit in base 10. Other than that weird place that I put the carry, okay, which is not usual, but in terms of you know, how we figure out each individual digit, do we have any questions? Yes. So the difference between standard addition and this is it's fixed to the width of the input numbers. Yes. That's one. And then the carry has its own role. Okay. It is is a very explicit, you know, second, you know, a separate role just for the carry. Okay. And I denote when there's a carry of zero, I I denote that as well. So I don't just put a little tiny one when there's a carry of one, when there's a carry of zero, I make sure that I understand there is a carry of zero. Okay, yep. Um, 
why this is necessary, how this is applicable. Yeah. Well, it's because we want to we want to transfer the knowledge about addition from what we are familiar with, which is base ten, to something new, which is base two. But in order to do that, I need to have I need to express how the digits relate to each other. And this allows me to explicitly say, look at this digit over here. Look at, look at uh, this digit over here. How is it related to the, the rest of the digits? So I need a way to uh, designate each digit in the entire calculation so I can use equations to relate one digit to, every, to the digits that it depends on. And this format allows me to do that. Okay, so there, this is not it. Okay, so we have to add something on top of this in order to do what I just said. But that's a good question. So keep that question in mind. At the end of today's lecture, if you still have that question, but then we'll we'll you know, expand our discussion um, on Thursday. Is that okay? But I have a suspicion that by the by the end of today's lecture, you guys will go like, oh, so that's why we are doing it this way. Is that okay? All right, cool. All right, so remember what I just said. I need to have a way to designate every single digit in the entire calculation. So that means I have to name the rows. This is row X, this is row Y, this is row Q, this is row K, and this is row S. That's just the way that I you know, assign your names to these particular rows. So X, Y are really just the numbers that you're given with to do the addition. Um, you know, the S row is the sum, and hence the, the, you know, the letter S. The K row, interestingly, is the carry row. You go like, tech, can't you spell? Yes, I know carry starts with a C, but I have a different use of the letter C. So we'll see why it is, like how C is being used here later on. And then Q is just Q. I cannot remember why I chose the letter Q, but it's just Q, okay? Now, we also want to designate the columns because when we designate the row and the columns, then I have a grid you know, format and I can designate, I can name every single bit in this case. So I'm gonna choose a different color, okay? Because from your perspective, my tablet is black and white so it doesn't show to me. But from your perspective, it's easier to read when it is color coded because otherwise you can easily interpret the zero, the one, two, three, that's part of the number that is being processed. No, those are really just you know the the columns. Okay, you know, the designation of the column. Yes. In row K, uh, it looks like we have four digits to work with. Yep, that's fine. Well, yes. So you're correct. The K is the only one that seems to have four digits. But inside the computer, guess what happens? It only keeps track of one. It only keeps track of the overall carry of the entire addition. The other carry bits are no are not explicitly represented. So when it, and there's no need to do that either. Okay, so we'll we'll get to that one you know, in, in just a little bit. Okay, but that's a good question. Okay, how do we deal with the carry having four bits instead of three bits? So the most of the carry bits are basically hidden. They are not even represented. They are not even necessary. How can they not be necessary when you're trying to add? We'll figure that out probably in the next two you know, lectures because today's lecture will only get you up to a certain point and we need the other two lectures to get to the point where you, know, you will start to understand, oh, so that means you know, K1 and K2 are really not needed at all in an addition. They go like, how? So we'll get to that point eventually. All right, so I'm switching back to the usual color. All right. So now we can designate you know, each bit with an, each digit with a name. For instance, um, if I were to pick out this one here, what is the designation of this particular digit? How would you call it? Which row does it belong to? Y, sub one. y and it is y of 1. Okay, y sub 1. And what about this guy here? It belongs to the row of K, and which which column does it belong to? K2, very good. And then we have this one here. This is 
row s bit zero. Okay, very good. So I'm just using this as an example of how we designate each and every single digit. Are we good so far? So, so far, what have we covered? We have covered base 10 addition, multi-digit, right? Uh, we have covered a way to name every single digit in the entire edition. So now it is time to figure out, um, okay, so how do we relate the digits, okay? So let me ask you, how did we end up with this three here? Six plus seven is three with a carry of one. What does that mean? It is the, web, the value of 13, but why did I break up the 10 as the carry and then the, the 1, you know, as the actual single digit sum of 7 plus 6? So it fits on that uh, ordinate grid of that zero. Exactly. Yep, exactly. It fits there. It's also because 13, it cannot be represented by a single digit in base 10. And therefore, we have a carry. Does anyone remember when you learned multi-digit addition? Does anyone have any younger siblings or children or nieces or nephews who are now starting to learn multi-digit addition? Okay, so what is the challenge? They have to know six plus six is two with a carry of one. 1 plus 1 is also 2, but without a carry, or a carry of 0. So how many things do you have to memorize in order to carry out multi-digit addition? Well, let's think about it. Okay. So we are looking at a matrix, okay? 0 to 9, 0 to 9 in addition. So each cell will tell you the result of the addition of those digits in terms of what is the single digit sum and also whether there's a carry or not, right? And then you guys go like, okay, so originally we have 100 entries in this table because it is a 10 by 10 matrix. We have 10 digits as X, we have 10 digits as Y, and therefore there are 100 cases that we have to figure out what is the single digit sum versus whether there's a carry of one or not. You guys are smart, you go like, but heck, I know my algebra. Addition is commutative, which means you, know, you can switch the ordering of the operands and they give you the same answer. So right away you go like, oh, we can cut it by half. Because it is symmetric along the diagonal line. Right? 6 plus 7 is the same as 7 plus 6. They both have a single digit sum of 3 and a carry of 1. Oh, cool. Okay, now we only got 50 entries. So we cut it down to 50 entries. And then someone goes, oh, I also know my algebra. I know the identity of addition. What is the identity of addition? What does it mean? The identity of addition is the value where you can add that to any value, and it doesn't change the value at all. So in addition, what is the identity? Zero. Very good. OK. So that means you know, the, the row corresponding to zero is not needed, right? Because you know, anything plus zero is zero. And then the row corresponding, well, this row is not, it's already gone. So we now say, okay, we're down to 40 entries. But 40 entries is still plenty. I think most of us cannot remember now, how long did it take you to gain the competency of I know how to perform multi-digit addition because I got these 40 entries all memorized. It takes a little bit of time, okay? You know, even though you cannot remember that anymore, it does take a little bit of time, okay? I still remember in uh, first grade, the way I was taught about this type of thing is we had blocks, okay? So there are blocks of length of two, blocks of length of three, and so on. So we basically say, okay, this is a block of six, this is a block of seven, kind of you know, concatenate, you know, using our term, concatenate the blocks, and then you measure that block against a block of 10. You go like, okay, the portion that is sticking out is the single digit sum, and the fact that it is 
longer than a block of 10, or at least a block of 10, means we have a carry of one. So it's very tactile, you know, you can kind of play with these blocks and they all have different colors, so it's kind of fun, but it takes time to learn that, okay? All right. Hmm, okay. So we are going to try to generalize, okay? So we know how this three is coming from because it comes from seven plus six is a 13, and we only want the least significant digit, which is the three. So we'll call that function r, okay? So there's a function r where seven, six, you know, is going to give you an answer of three, and an r of three, six is going to give you nine. The r of six, three will also give you nine, you know, because those are explaining why we have um, q1 and also q2 being nine, because three plus six is nine, six plus three is also nine. And then we have nine plus one being a zero, nine plus one being a zero, please, three plus a zero is a three. So we have the r of three zero being a three, the r of nine one being a zero, r of nine one being a zero, so these are the very specific cases that are used in this example. I know the clock is covering the, the first one, but the, what it's covering is a three. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay, so I'm trying to define the function r. So knowing, okay, this is what r is supposed to do, how do you write r as a c function? If I want you to write r as a c function, what is that going to look like? It is trying to extract the one or digit zero of the sum of two single digit number in base 10. So how do you write that function in C or C++? In this class, C and C++ are basically interchangeable because we only talk about the overlap between those two languages. But how do you write that function? Okay, so let's... Let's go to a text editor because I can type a whole lot faster than I can write, especially when we are talking about an algorithm. So let me find that. Oh, I just skipped past it. We can do this. Okay, so we'll go ahead and uh, make a new one. New window. There we go. Okay, so we are talking about unsigned R. It takes unsigned X, which is a single digit in base 10 unsigned y, which is also a single digit in base 10. So what are we going to, how are we going to define this function? I want it to return only the least significant digit of the sum. Yes. Yes. All right. So all this is going to do is to return x plus y, the whole thing, mod 10. That's all we need. So are we in agreement that this definition of R will get the job done based on you know, the actual example here of how we apply the function R in this concrete example? Are we all in agreement? Okay, all right, excellent. What about the carries? Well, the carries is a little bit more complex. So I'm going to go back to the... Um, okay, I just past that. So we go back to this picture here. So this time color coding is super important because uh, one carry comes from one source and then the other two comes from the other source. So I have to illustrate that. So we'll switch the color to, eh, let's switch to red for now. So this carry of one, why do we have a one here? Which two digits, the addition of which two digits result in this particular carry. So you can name the digits as x blah blah and y blah blah. Y is x zero, y zero, that is correct. So the addition of x zero, y zero results in the one that is now circled in red. Okay, so we'll go ahead and highlight it. It's like, all right, seven plus six is greater than or equal to 10, and therefore we have a carry of one. Does that make sense? Okay. Then we look at the next one, we look at K2, and we'll try to figure out where that is coming from. So we'll switch to a different color, okay? So we'll switch to color green this time. 
and we are looking at this one here. And who is, what is the reason why we end up with the one here? The addition of which two digit results in this one? Yep. Q1, K1. Q1 and K1. Okay, very good. That is correct. So between these two digits, we end up with you know, the, the green you know, one, you know, the one that is in a green rectangle. I'll switch color one more time to blue. And now we're looking at this one here. Why is a one over here? The addition of which the addition of which two digits results in this one? Q2 and K2, very good. Okay. So apparently there are two reasons up you know to where why we have a carry of one. It can be the addition of the XY digits, but they can also be the addition of the Q and the K digits. Is that okay? But in either case, okay, why do we conclude with a carry of one? I actually spoke that reasoning a few minutes ago. See if you guys can remember. We end up with a one or carry of one because and in base 10, you know, we basically we end up with a sum that is greater than or equal to 10. Does that make sense? Okay, let me say that one more time, okay, and see if you guys you think it makes sense. We have a carry of one whenever the sum, the sing, whenever the sum of two digits is greater than or equal to 10. Is that making any sense? Okay, excellent. So, if I want to call this, you know, the C function, then we say the C of, oh, okay, that's the wrong color. Let me switch back to the usual color. Yeah. Yeah, my tablet is black and white. I cannot actually see the color, so I can only remind myself, oh, wait, that's the wrong color. All right, so the C of seven, six, is a one, the C of three zero is a zero, the C of three six is a zero, the C of six three is a zero, the C of nine one is a one, the C of nine one is also a one. In other words, I have just enumerated, listed, you know, all the actual concrete cases of applying the C function, you know, in this you know, entire diagram. Are we okay so far? So now we are trying to abstract it, okay? In other words, I know what the C function is supposed to do. How do I write that code in C and C++? What do you think? So we know what the C function is supposed to do. So now you know, if I want to write it as an actual, oh, this is the wrong uh, window. There we go. So let me go back here and we say unsigned C of unsigned um, I'm just naming the parameters as X and Y. They do not necessarily have to correspond to the rows X and Y. They're just names for the parameters. So what do you think this is going to look like? Under what conditions should I return a 1? And under what conditions should I return a 0? We just, we just explore that, right? So how do we write it out in C and C++? I know, mo I know what most of you are thinking. I want to use if. Okay, resist that urge. <laughs> okay, instead, let's see if we can use the ternary operator. Okay, most of you, some of you are thinking, um, we don't need anything special because, you know, can't we just say, you know, if x plus y is greater than or equal to 10, you know, we return the true, and that's the end of it. What is the problem of this particular solution? In order to answer that question, you have to recall what is considered true in C and C++. I know C++ has a bool type, B-O-O-L, the Boolean type, but you can also work with things without the Boolean type and use it in a Boolean context. So now you have to remember, what does it mean to be true in a, for an expression in C++, and what does it mean to be false in C++? Yes? True is True is, is exactly. So 
the most important part is not about false because false has one single value representing it, zero. Yes. Integer division. Yes, you can use integer division, but division is expensive. It's also a fairly complicated thing to do. So I would avoid the use of division if I can. I mean, if you have plenty of resources and you know, having the program to run fast is not a, it's not an issue. Sure, you can use division too. But if I want to save resources and, and I just want to boil down to comparison, what is the problem with this one? The false is not a problem because there's one single integer value representing false. That is zero. Okay? Don't have a problem. But what values would represent true as an integer? I mean, after all, I have the return type of unsigned, which means you know, this expression just has to be some kind of value that is unsigned. So if you're talking about a 32-bit unsigned integer, we have 2 to the power of 32 minus 1 ways of saying true. How many options do we have? About 4 billion something. <laughs> and what we actually desire, which is 1, is one of the values that your compiler can choose to use. Now, can your compiler choose to use a different non-zero value to represent true every single time it has to return a value true? Yeah, it's up to the compiler. The compiler can say, I'm going to use a random number generator to return the value of true. As long as it is not zero, it is true. Okay? So that means this code here may work. Okay? It depends on the implementation of the compiler. But I can give you text version of a C compiler that is going to push the envelope of hey, the standard only says this. If I do it this way, which is really weird, it is still compliant to the C standard. So that compiler will break this program because it's not going to return one all the time. So what we need to do here is to say, yeah, it's an easy fix. This is the condition. This is what we return when it is true. And this is what we return when it is false. This is called a ternary operator, or ternary expression in this case, because I'm actually using it in an expression. How many people want me to explain a ternary expression? Okay, very good. So a ternary expression has three parts, and hence the name ternary. So the first part in this case is this condition here. So this is the condition, almost like the condition of a conditional statement. It can be true, can be false. That's all we care about. When this condition is true, then we choose whatever is between the question mark and the colon, we evaluate it, and that becomes the value of the overall expression. Is that, is that okay? In other words, you can look at what is highlighted you know, on the projector right now as the quote unquote true value, the value to return when the expression is true. Then the other one is called the value of force false. It is, this is the value of the entire expression when the condition is false. In other words, this is basically an if-else statement compressed to a single expression. It can go anywhere you can expect a numerical value, which is extremely cool. Especially if you like recursion stuff. Oh, this can make things really interesting. Uh, we will see that, okay? Yeah, we will actually use recursion and the ternary operator quite a bit in this class. What if somebody is to say, but tech, I have no interest in learning the ternary operator because I will never use it. It is so obscure. I will never use it. So, so you're wasting time teaching me about the ternary operator. So what, what do you think about you know, that particular statement? Yep. Well, you cannot turn down more tools. That is true, but some people are very pragmatic, okay, which I can understand. You know, efficiency is important. So the question is, are you going to write new code as a developer all the time? What do you think is your first responsibility when you are hired as an entry-level developer? 
documentation, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Customer support, documentation, okay? You know, when somebody, you know, when people call in and say the program doesn't work, it's you answering their phone, okay? It depends on the company. But for the most part, you don't get to write new code. Your boss does not trust you with new code. So what you're going to do is to debug existing code, okay? The program doesn't work. We have a ticket coming in saying the program is crashing under these specific conditions, blah, 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 blah. And you are the person, you know, after, you know, Everything is checked in in the repository so that you know, whatever you do is undoable. Now it is your job to fix that problem. So what does that have anything to do with the ternary operator? The person who wrote the existing code may be using the ternary operator, and it is your job to understand what the code is saying. So you cannot just say, since I'm not going to use it, I don't have to understand it, because you have to understand what other people, you know, have written in that code. And most of the time, you cannot even call that person up because that person may have resigned. In the case of COBOL programs, that person is likely to have passed away. <laughs> so there we go. All right. So now that we have these two functions defined, OK, you know, these are the definitions. They are actually in the module, OK? So I am not talking about something that we haven't seen before. It's all here. Okay, and this is why it is important to read ahead of time because, okay, there's a downside to reading ahead because for people like me, if I were to read ahead, the class would be like so boring that I'd be falling asleep. So for me, okay, it is important to keep my curiosity up, which means reading ahead of time is not necessarily productive for me. So the question is, do you learn the same way that I do? I don't know. I'm not you. Okay, so you kind of have to figure out what you need to do to learn effectively. For me, I don't read ahead because I need to keep that curiosity up. Now, one of my buddies, you know, extremely bright individual working at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, okay, it's probably with an IQ that is at least 10, 20 points higher than mine. He has to pre-read, take extensive notes review his own notes, refine his own notes, and so on. Why? Because he has dyslexia. Words are all jumbled up naturally. He really has to focus and pay attention when he's reading. Then that's why writing for him is important because you know, when you're writing things, you know, I guess you know, dyslexia does, is, does not impact people when they're writing their own stuff. So he has a different learning method than I do, and it works for him. So you guys have to figure out what works for you. There's no one single universal method where you go like, oh, so this is the method to study, to take classes. Nope, everybody's a little bit different. All right, so now getting back to here. Now where, where, what are we going with all this stuff here? Because it seems so fragmented. It's like, what are we doing? Well, now we go for the conclusion of all of this stuff here. How do we express one particular digit as an equation using possibly some of the other digits? Now we can go for that. All right, so I'm going to give you the most general form. What do you think about Q of I? In other words, you know, things on this particular row. First of all, okay, we're going to use a function. But what more importantly, what, what do you think it depends on? What, the, what are the bits that we need to know in order to determine the Q of I bits? Yep. X, M, I, Y, sub I. X, I, Y, I. Okay, that's correct. And which function are we going to use to compute the Q bits? Well, we only have introduced two functions, right? So it's one or the other. You have a 50-50% chance of guessing it. But you don't have to guess. Because... These concrete examples are already showing you. It's already narrowing it down to one particular function. What is it? It's the R function. Okay, it is the R function here. Okay, and then the same thing applies to S of I, except it is the R function of which two bits? How do we end up with this three over here, or the zero over here, or the zero over here? It is the application of Q and K, that's right, okay, so we have the Q 
I K I over here. All right, so we nail down <clears throat> two of the three rows that we have to compute. The one remaining is not so easy. It's the carry bits, okay? Because there are two sources, you know, for the carry bits. So if you just look at this carry bit here, well, I mean, depending on the digits that we are dealing with, this carry bit of one can be coming from these two, not this particular case, but it can, right? And it can also be coming from here. So that means there are two ways to end up with a carry of one for any bit on the or for any digit on the k row. So now when we look at the k row, okay, it's k of i plus one because it is the next column, okay, because you need to rely on the previous column or the column immediately to the right hand side to determine the carry bit of the current column. So I'm using k plus one to indicate, oh, this is for the next column. This is the C of X, I, Y, I. Oh, that's an awful looking C. There you go. C of X, I, Y, I plus the C of Q, I, K, I. Does that make sense? Because what this is saying is for every bit over here, this bit here, okay, this particular digit of this particular carry can be because, you know, this digit plus, digit plus this digit is greater than or equal to 10. Or it can also be because of this digit plus this digit is greater than or equal to 10. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So now this is the foundation of what we're going to do on Thursday. Because on Thursday, we're going to look at this and go like, hmm, what do we do in base 2? Okay. So we'll try to answer that question right now is attack. All you have done is to re-explain things that we have learned in elementary school, except they did not take the scenic route to explain all of this stuff using all of these symbols totally unnecessarily. Well, that may appear to be true. But now, if I want to say, but how do we do this in base two? What do you think? I can do it in at the most five seconds. The explanation of how to do base 2 addition with all the stuff that we have talked about can be explained in five seconds. How is that the case? Okay. Yes. Exactly. That's all we need to do. We go here and say, hmm, you want base 2? Fine. <laughs> We're done. Okay, if you're one of if you're those hap, 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 hap pods in the movie Arrival and go like, oh, but I want base seven, fine, easy peasy, and we're done. Because the structure of multi-digit addition is exactly the same regardless of the base. Is that okay? So this is why I said earlier and mention why we need a way to designate, to name every single digit, so I can end up with definitions to relate a digit to the digits that it, de de that it depends on. That is the whole reason why we have this entire sort of complicated scheme to refer to each individual digit, to define the function R, to define the function C, and so on. But those definitions do not add anything. It's not based on anything that you have not known already. Because you have done all this stuff for what? 10, 20 years? In my case, you know, 40 something years. I'm old. Okay. So the transition, okay, how we transfer what we already know to something new that we want to do, this is how we do it. Okay. We take a close look at how we do things. For the things that we're familiar with, we extract the pattern. Okay, so once again, we are talking about patterns, abstraction. Okay, that is what mathematicians do. But guess what? Computer science is a field, it's a subfield of mathematics. As much as we do not want it to be the case, it is. <laughs> okay, because all the rules in mathematics are man made, none of that is natural. Okay. Now, does it model things you know, in, the nat in the natural world? Yeah, it does. Okay, But nonetheless, all of those rules are man-made. Well, 
What do you think of the syntax of a programming language? What do you think of the meaning of a loop in, in a programming language? Those are not natural. Those are all man-made, okay? It's all invented by computer scientists. So computer science really is a branch of mathematics, and I think it helps when we treat it as such. So are we good so far? Okay. And I will give you a preview of you know, what we'll be talking about on Thursday. Because it would seem that, are we done already here? Because now we know how to perform addition in base 2. Well, we have a few problems. Why do we have a few problems? Because as much as we want to avoid the use of you know, these arithmetic operators, we still have a bunch. Okay. In other words, if I were to do base 2 calculation, I still need arithmetic addition. And what is, the, what is the current title of this module? How to do base 2 addition. So if I need binary addition in order to do binary addition, don't you think we, don't you think we have a little problem here? Yes, it's called chicken and egg. Okay? So we don't want to rely on arithmetic operations to perform these operations. We want to translate everything down to, guess what? You, you should probably know this answer already. Logic gates, okay, or logical operations. We want to translate everything down to and or not, because all of those can translate to NAND, and that can translate to transistors. And we know that we can buy transistors to build computers. Okay, that is the focus on Thursday. So on Thursday, we look at things that we know how to do, but rely on arithmetic operations, and then we'll figure out a way to get away with it. It's like, no, we actually don't need mod. We don't need addition. We don't even need comparison. All we need are not and or. That would be the focus on Thursday. So if you read ahead of time, even if you cannot get everything 100%, which I'm not expecting, it will still help you get gain a overall understanding of the big picture. So by the time I get into the details with examples and whatnot, hopefully, that will help you know, the concepts you know, sink in. Um, also, on Thursday, I have invited people from RAD reading across disciplines. Have you guys heard of that program on this campus? No? OK. So reading across disciplines, OK, I do need to kind of do a pre-advertisement on that one because I think it is important. So it's RAD, uh, American River College. So this is a very interesting program. They offer very low unit count uh, classes to basically help, you know, not help, but to make, to let people read more effectively when they're dealing with course material. Because reading Harry Potter is very different from reading my instructions. For some reason, okay, you know, most students say that, Tech, you have a way to write things in a very obscure way. It is not like it is wrong or it is incomplete. It's just that it's hard to get the content out of my writing. And trust me, I do not do that intentionally, okay? Because that requires effort, and I really do not like to put effort into things that really do not matter to me. So I just naturally have the ability to write things in an obscure way, or at least according to some people. I also have people who say, oh, your stuff is so easy to read. I just kind of breeze through the whole thing. I get all the content. So I get people from either side, okay? But you don't get to choose, okay? Especially when you get to, get to a four-year university, you don't get to choose and go like, I want to choose a professor like Iraj, okay, who can explain things in a very plain way. Most of the time, you don't get to choose. So reading across the disciplines will teach you techniques, okay, skills, not only to read difficult material, but also, you know, to you know, but they will teach you techniques of taking notes, how to review your notes, how to use your notes to help you in your exam. Like in this class, okay, our exams are all open book and open notes. So knowing that ahead of time, what are you going to do? Take your notes in a way to help you with the exams. So that means I'm not just going to write down things verbatim during the class. That can be important. But you also want to organize things in a way such that, okay, I'm condensing everything within these six weeks into two sheets of paper. 
Okay, all the definitions go here, all the diagrams go here, and so on. Now, how you want to organize your stuff is up to you because everybody wants to organize things in a different way. That is your study guide. Because I keep getting people asking me for study guide before an exam. I go like, I cannot give you a study guide because the way I organize things is different from the way that you organize. So you have to be preparing for the study guide the entire time, every single class, after every single class. Go through the material and just say that if I have an exam, you know, what are the important things that I need to remind myself of during the exam? The definitions. Okay? You know, sometimes I highlight the definitions when I explain them. Like here. Okay? They are in a box right here because they are important. Okay? Other times they are in definitions, like in the C code that we just talked about, like that. It doesn't take up a lot of space. And you might say, but all of this stuff, I, it's already in the notes. I don't have to write it down you know, separately. Why do you want to write it down separately in your own notes? And not just say that, well, it's all your know, tech has it all been written in the modules. I just have to print out the modules, bring it with me, and I got all the material. The question is, can you find the definitions in time? The exams have a time limit, okay? So the quicker you can locate the information, the better. And locating information based on how I write can be challenging unless you are me. So how many of you are me, are tech? None of you, right? But you are you, so that means that you have to figure out the best way for yourself to locate all the information that may be useful in an exam and do it in an incremental manner. Okay, don't do it just one week before the exam. Do it every single class. After every single class, just kind of refine your notes. Okay, you know, if it's in digital form, it's easier. But if it's in written form, it's still okay. I mean, you can still manage it. All right. So, with all that said, I am going to move on and give you the lab for today. Yes, there is a lab for today. I'm glad that nobody is asking. It's base conversion. It's this one here. And it does have an access code. The access code to this one is heptapot. So I will write it down. So hepta is seven. So heptapod are creatures with seven limbs, such as those in the movie Arrival. Great movie. Very interesting. All right, so with all that said, I'm going to let you guys decide whether you want to take a short break and then come back to do the lab or whether you want to get a head start on the lab already. And I am going to stop the recorder. But before I do that, do we have any additional questions that I can address while I'm still recording? Questions? All right, excellent. So I am going to stop the